What's up, everybody? We are in 2 Kings 5 today, continuing with the story of Elisha, roughly page 386 in the scriptures. And it is chilly out here today. It's Carhartt weather. I'll take it. If you've not been following along, and I admonish you every week with this, but I know there's many people who are finding these videos uh, each week, which is a blessing from our Creator. If you've not been following along, you're going to be a little bit lost in where we are with this story. Um, so I recommend you pull out your Bible and you read along, and uh, you may want to check out the previous videos um, in the timeline. You know, we do one of these every week. Uh, started in Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and Matthew 1 1. This is the genealogy of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Okay, and we've been working our way forward from both of those to the point now where we have read uh, together, at least in the Old Testament, approaching 400 pages and uh, a whole bunch in the New Testament as well. In fact, we're in Hebrews as of right now in the New Testament, and there's not much left after Hebrews. You got Hebrews, you got James, first uh, John, second John, third John, Jude, and then Revelation. Whew, that's gonna be fun. Anyway, we are in uh, 2 Kings 5 today, continuing in the story of Elisha. So bust your Bible out and read along. And Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram. Now, there's going to be multiple kings in this story, so pay attention, all right? Of Aram, was a great man in the eyes of his master and highly respected, because by him, Yahuwah had given deliverance to Aram. And he was a brave man, Naaman, the uh, general of Aram. But he was leprous. And the Arameans had gone out to raid and had brought back a captive, a young girl from the land of Israel, and she served the wife of Naaman. Okay, so she was like a handmaid to uh, Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Shomeron, then he would recover him of his leprosy. He said, you know, there's a guy in Shomeron who could handle that for you. And Naaman went in and reported to his master, to the king of uh, Aram. So the generals reporting to the king, thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Hey, she said this. And the king said to Aram, go, enter, and let me send a letter to the king of Israel. And he went and took with him 10 talents of silver, so 726 pounds of silver, and 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of garments, the king did. And he brought the letter, and so the king of Aram hands into the hand of Naaman these 10 talents of silver, these uh, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of garments, and sends a letter of recommendation from the, king of Na from the king of Aram in his general Naaman's hand to the king of Israel, basically a letter of introduction saying, hey, I, this guy's one of my guys. We've sent these gifts with you. Could you introduce him to the man of Elohim? He's got leprosy, and we want him to be healed. And he, Naaman, brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, And now, when this letter comes to you, see, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, so that you shall recover him of his leprosy. <coughs> and it came to be, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his garments and said, Am I Elohim to kill and keep alive that this man sends a man to me to recover him of his leprosy? So the king of Israel is like, What am I supposed to do about this? Am I Yahweh the Elohim? That negative. What am I supposed to do about this? For consider now and see how he is seeking an occasion with me. And it came to be when Elisha, the man of Elohim, heard that the king of Israel had torn his garments, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your garments? So Elisha hears that the king's all distraught, that Naaman from Aram has come to be healed of leprosy. And he's like, Dude, what's up with you? Why are you tearing your garments? Please let him come to me so that he knows that there is a prophet in Israel. Let him come to me so that he knows that Yahuwah has still put his name here. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the entrance of the house of Elisha. And so there's a handoff from the king of Israel here. And if we turn back one page, 
we'll see that the king of Israel at this point, well, it might be a couple of pages. I believe it's Yehoram. King of Israel. I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat is the king of Israel at this point. And so, I know, many kings. <laughs> so the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, sends Naaman, the Aramean, the general from Aram, to Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, go, meaning Elisha sent a messenger to Aram, the guy who needs, no, to Naaman, the guy who needs to be healed. Lots of moving parts. Game of telephone, anybody? And Elisha sent a messenger to him, to Naaman, saying, go, and you shall wash seven times in the Jordan, that your flesh might be restored to you and be clean. But Naaman became wroth and went away and said, See, I said to myself, he would certainly come out to me and stand and call on the name of Yahuwah, his Elohim, and wave his hand over the place and recover from leprosy. So Naaman comes to Elisha, and Elisha's like, Cool, good to see you. Go wash in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman's like, what the H-E double hockey sticks, bro? I was sure you were going to call down the name of Yah and wave your hands all over the place, and I'd just be cured of leprosy. So uh, a little bit, uh, you know, Elisha's not really managing Naaman's expectations here, which is not his job. He's a man of Elohim, right? <laughs> Are there not the Abana and the Parfar, or the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus? <laughs> Better than all the waters of Israel. It's like, dude, I could have taken a bath in a river at home. Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had spoken to you a great matter, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? He's like, if he gave you a really difficult task to be healed, wouldn't you have done it? All he's saying is go take a bath in the Jordan seven times. Pretty easy, right? Then he, Naaman, went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of Elohim. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of Elohim, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, See, now I know that there is no Elohim in all the earth except in Israel. And now please take a gift from your servant. So he's healed. He does what Elisha tells him to do, and he's healed of his leprosy. And he says, there is no Elohim in all the earth except in Israel. Whew. That's a phrase right there. We talk all the time about what is Israel. Well, Israel was the, uh, it's the 12 descendants of Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel in Genesis 32. And Israel literally means in Hebrew, he who is struggling with Elohim, just like Naaman was, he who has overcome with Elohim, just like Naaman has here, and then he who is ruling with Elohim. And this is a constant um, theme throughout the word. If you look in Revelation 2 through 4, take a pen or a pencil and underline everywhere it says, to he who overcomes. This is Yeshua speaking, Jesus. To he who overcomes, I shall dot, dot, dot. That's Israel. He who overcomes is Israel, right? And so Israel is the 12 tribes, which we are grafted into. Romans 11, 16-ish, somewhere in there. We are grafted in. We are branches that are grafted into the rootstock. What's the rootstock? It's Israel, right? So um, Israel is us. There is no Elohim in all the world but in us. It's not a nation state on the map. It is a piece of land the promised land that was promised to the seed of Abraham, comma, comma, it's way bigger than what the United Nations came up with in 1947, which is why there's a uh, struggle, strife, and heartache in that area and has been for the last 5,500 years or so. That's a different rabbit hole. And so Naaman washes himself and says, there is no Elohim in all the earth, except here in Israel. Um, and now please take a gift from your servant. He's like, let me pay you something for your time. But he said, Elisha said, as Yahuwah lives before whom I stand, I do not accept it. 
And he pressed on him to accept it, but he refused. And so Naaman kept trying to give him this gift, but Elisha refused. And then Naaman said, If not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for no longer is your servant going to make an ascending offering and a slaughtering to other mighty ones, but to Yahuwah. He literally wants loads of earth from Israel to take back with him to build an altar to Yah. That's pretty cool, right? So this guy has had a conversion. He's had a change of heart and an understanding of the mind, right? And he's like, I'm not serving anybody, but Yah. And then he goes on, Yah will grant forgiveness to your servant in this matter. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the house of Ramon, this being the king that he serves, the king of Aram, when I bow down in the house of Ramon, when I bow down in the house of Ramon, Yahuwah, please grant forgiveness to your servant in this matter. It's like, look, you know, I got to, as part of my duties, I got to go into this house with my worldly master, but I'll be praying to Yah. And he, Elisha, said to him, go in peace. And he went from him some distance. And Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of Elohim, said, look, my master has spared Naaman, this Aramean, while not receiving from his hand what he brought. But as Yahuwah lives, I shall run after him and take whatever from him. So Gehazi's like, now remember what like one chapter ago, they're starving to death, okay? Like they're starving to death. And then this guy shows up with all this stuff and he's like, hey, uh, thanks for the blessing. I want to give you all this stuff. And Elisha says, no, this is very reminiscent with Abraham in the Valley of Siddim after the uh, 318 trained servants of his house go and rescue Lot from the five kings, right? And it, he comes back and Abraham said, basically says, I'm not taking nothing from y'all. I will not have it known that Abraham was made rich from y'all scumbags, not doing it. We took only what was necessary to feed the men who were in battle. The rest of it's yours, take it. Right? And so this is, again, very reminiscent here of Elisha saying, nope, not doing it. However, Elisha's servant Gehazi is looking upon us going, bro, we be starving to death. We might want to take some of this stuff, you know, a little gold, a little silver, and some garments that could go a long way towards feeding us. The temptation of the treasure of the enemy here. Think about that. The temptation of the treasure of the enemy here. And so Gehazi, Elisha's servant, pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him. And he said, is there peace? Everything good, bro? And he said, peace. My master, this is Gehazi speaking. My master has sent me saying, look, even now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Gehazi, be lying. That's not what Elisha said at all. He said, I will not accept it. Twice, he said. And there's instruction for that in Titus. Reject a divisive man only twice. Titus 3 something, I believe. Right? And so, uh, but Gehazi's straight up lying. And he says, look, uh, even now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. A talent of silver, 72.6 pounds. No biggie, right? And Naaman said, please accept two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants. And so Naaman lays up two of his servants. And they bear ahead of him with Gehazi back to where Gehazi had come from. And this area is roughly Dothan is known as where it is, question mark. Dothan, Carmel, that area. <laughs> and so Naaman sends two of his servants, each with a talent of silver and a change of clothing, change of garments, with Gehazi back to where Elisha is at. And when he came to the high place, he took them from their hand, Gehazi did, and stored them away in the house and let the men go and they went. So he's keeping this matter secret from his master. 
And he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant didn't go anywhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to accept silver and to accept garments and olive trees and vineyards and sheep and cattle and male and female servants? I knew what you were up to. Did not my heart go with you? What an interesting way to phrase that. I know you so well. I know what you're up to. So let the leprosy of Naaman cling to you and your descendants forever. And Gehazi and he went out from him, Elisha, as leprous as snow. So Elisha puts this curse of leprosy on Gehazi for taking the spoils from Naaman after Elijah had rejected it and for lying to Elisha to his master his master who knew his heart can't you see the parallels here between the father and us he was untruthful with him I set before you this day life and a blessing or death and a curse right Six, and the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, see the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. It's like, we need more room, man. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a log from there and let us make a place to dwell. And he answered, go. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Go cut some trees down. We'll build some more. We'll do an addition. Sounds good. A little remodeling. Then the one said, please undertake to go with your servants. And Elisha said, I shall go. Sounds good. And he went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. Right? These are, remember, these are men of Elohim, right? They're just going to go do some logging by hand. I'm sure they were really soft, effeminate beta males wearing salmon colored polo shirts, standing behind a, poly, a podium in a mega church, talking really soft like this, brother. Yeah. Uh huh. And Elisha went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. And it came to be, as one was cutting down a tree, that the iron axe head fell into the water. So the axe head comes loose from the handle, and it goes flying into the water. And he cried out and said, oh, my master, for it was borrowed. It wasn't my axe, dude. Remember, like, they be starving to death. There's scarcity of food in the land. They're living off of donations. And now the axe breaks, and the head flies into the water. And this guy's like, how in the world am I supposed to repay that or even recover it? The axe head fell into the river. And the man of Elohim said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And he, Elisha, cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, pick it up. And he reached out his hand and took it. It's a cool little sign right there, right? Oh, ye of little faith. And the king of Aram, so... Shift perspective in the story here. And the king of Aram was fighting against Israel. Now this being the same king of Aram that just sent Naaman to the king of Israel to uh, get his guy healed, right? To get Naaman healed up. Comma. Sometimes the uh, macro strategic needs outweigh the micro tactical needs, right? And so the king of Israel, I'm sorry, and the king of Aram was fighting against Israel. And took counsel with his servants, saying, My camp is in such and such a place. He said, Hey, we're going to set up camp over here. And the men of Elohim sent, so Elijah sends to the king of Israel, saying, Be on guard. Do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down from there. He said, BT dubs. The Arameans are set up over here. They've got a fob over in this location. They're establishing a base camp. It's going to be rough. Don't go over there. Now, it's also probably important, important to point out at this point. Look at the status of Elisha. He is the man of Elohim. He is the prophet. And he is, it sounds like, on a first name basis with these kings in the region. That is the power and authority that he wields in the name of Yah. And everybody recognized it. And remember, he was given a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And Elijah be lopping people's heads off uh the unrighteous people's heads off and was taken up into the sky with witnesses 50 witnesses in a whirlwind from yah and elisha is now wearing the mantle of elijah 
okay? He is the man of Elohim. And so people really don't want the man of Elohim working against them. And there's this understanding now where even if these kings are not conducting themselves in righteousness, which they're generally not, they understand and they respect the mantle of authority through the father that's been given to Elisha. And so they may not be working for the father, but they don't want to be caught working against him either. They don't want to be caught working against him either, much like Gehazi. But Elisha is not nobody. He's definitely somebody. These kings are approaching him, and he is approaching them. That says a lot about what his status is. And the king of Israel then sent to the place of which the man of Elohim had spoken to him and warned him so that he was on guard there, not once and not twice. And this greatly troubled the heart of the king of Aram. And he called his servants and said to them, Declare to me, who of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of you is a spy? Why, do they, why does the king of Israel know where we keep setting our fobs up at? And one of his servants, one of the servants of the king of Aram, said, None, my master, it's none of us, O king. For Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, declares to the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. This guy knows everything. This guy, Elisha, is telling the king of Israel everything. He knows what you're whispering in your bedroom, homie. And he said, go and see where he is. The king of Aram said, go and see where he, Elisha, is, so that I send and get him. And it was reported to him, the king saying, see, he is in Dothan. And he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And the servant of the man of Elohim, Gehazi, rose early and went out and saw an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant Gehazi said to him, Elisha, Oh, my master, what do we do? We're surrounded, bro. And he answered, Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Don't worry, bro. We're not outnumbered. Got a couple of tricks up my sleeve. Have you heard of this guy, Yahuwah? Exodus 15, verse 3 is like, you know how some people go, what's your life verse, brother? Yeah. Mine is Exodus 15, verse 3. Yahuwah is a warrior. Yahuwah is his name. Sums up everything about the spirit of Yah for me. He is a warrior. He goes to war for his people. He loves us so much. If you call upon his name and say, Father Yah, Abba Father, I need you. He's like, man, I've been waiting for you to call me up. Let's go. Let's go to work. Let's get some. Yahuwah is a warrior and Yahuwah is his name. It's not the Lord. It's not God. It's not. It's yod Hey vav Hey. Yahuwah his name and that just embodies the rejection of all the false churchianity for me that is my verse exodus 15 3 yahuwah is a warrior yahuwah is his name and so elijah's like we ain't outnumbered bro and elisha prayed and said yahuwah I pray, open his eyes and let him see. Gehazi we're talking about here. And Yahuwah opened the eyes of the young man, and he looked and saw the mountain covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This angelic army. There's some worship song. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Maybe. Maybe. Depends on whether or not you're walking in righteousness to the best of your ability. Luke 1 verse 6. And you see, I don't mean to camp on these things, but I guess we got to. When we see the words Yahuwah Sabaoth in the Hebrew, this is the Lord of hosts as it's translated in the King Jimmy and downstream from there. Those hosts, the in implication here, those hosts are rank upon rank upon rank, battalion upon battalion upon battalion. In 
retired companies of angels, warrior angels. And so when we see, for example, in Malachi 3 verse 6, I am the Lord Yahuwah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. I change not. This is the general speaking. With all that authority, authority, with all of his men of war arrayed behind him, ready to go into work. It's like when General James Mad Dog Mattis, right, was the guy in Uncle Sam's Misguided Children when he said, I am General James Mattis, United States Marine Corps. All of that authority, it's like all 235,000 of these bloodthirsty, combat hardened Marines will be coming for you if you transgress my word. It's like that times a bazillion for Yah. When he says, I'm the Lord Yahuwah Sabaoth, I change not. I am the Father ready to make war. I change not. Remember that, we hear all the time. You know, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Copy that. So when he says, keep my commands, did he change his mind? Well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, brother. You might want to reconcile those two things. Just saying. Because he's saying with all of the battle-hardened authority that he has as the creator of the heavens and the earth, I change not. And here is Elijah praying to the Father, saying, show this young man who you are. And there are angels everywhere ready to make war how badass is that imagine the imagery of that you're looking upon the mountains and the hills and there's there's chariots and there's fires and there's just you know rank upon rank upon rank upon rank upon rank of angels think of the relationship between elisha and yah See, we don't pray to angels. We don't worship angels. We worship Yah. We pray to Yah. And he says, son, you have support and resources available to you for your mission that you don't even know about. Think about that one. That's big. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to Yahuwah and said, Strike this nation with blindness, I pray. And he, Yahuwah, struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, to the army of the Arameans, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and let me bring, to you, to the, bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Shomeron, the capital of Israel, of wickedness. And it came to be when they'd come to Shomron that Elisha said, Yahuwah, open the eyes of these men so that they see. And Yahuwah opened their eyes, and they looked and saw they were in the midst of Shomron. And when the king of Israel saw them, he sees this army show up. He said to Elijah, my father, see, uh, the king is calling Elisha my father. In deference to the status of Elisha. My father, should I strike? Should I strike? Do I go to war? But Elisha said, do not strike. Do you strike those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them and let them eat and drink and go to their master. And he, the king of Israel, made a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he let them go and they went to their master. And the bands of Aramean raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Interesting. And after this, after this it came to be, that Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, mustered all of his army and went up and besieged Shomeron. And there was a great scarcity of food in Shomeron. And see, they besieged it until a donkey's head went at 80 pieces of silver. Today's math, a donkey's head, four to five thousand dollars. And one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five pieces of silver, 150 bucks for a quarter of a pile of dove, dove manure. There's no food. And it came to be as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, Help my master, O king. 
And he said, the king said, replying to this woman, if Yahuwah does not help you, where do I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? How do you expect me to help you? The threshing floor and the wine press. It's an interesting turn of phrase as well. The threshing floor is where the temple has been built by David, right? Well, by Solomon, all the materials. David bought the land, Solomon builds it. And David got all the materials. And the wine press, how many parables? The parable of the vineyard, for example. Does Yeshua have about the vine and the branches and the wine? His first miracle was the wine, which is the wedding feast, the celebration of the union of the bride of Christ and the bridegroom, Yeshua HaMashiach. But also, if you look at Revelation 19 and judgment, Yeshua treads out the winepress of the wrath of El Shaddai of Father God, right? The Lord Yahweh Sabaoth change not ready to make war on behalf of his people so the king says if Yah can't help you how am i supposed to help you the king said to her what is troubling you and she answered this woman said to me give your son and let us eat him today and tomorrow we eat my son there's no food so these two women make a pact today we're going to eat my son tomorrow we'll eat your son so we cooked my son and ate him and i said to her on the next day Give your son and let us eat him. But she has hidden her son. This is how bad things are in Shomeron. Shomeron. A system of false worship. Amongst the, amongst the literal children of Israel who are in false worship. <laughs> There's hard times. There's enemies coming. There's scarcity of food in the land. It reminds me very much so of these people who say, I don't need to worry about anything. I don't need to I don't need to stack food. I don't need to be prepared. God wouldn't let that happen to me. Well, if you're in false worship, yet claiming the name of Yah. Look at the abominations that these people are having to do just to get by. And it came to be when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his garments. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked and saw the sackcloth on his body underneath. And he said, Elohim, do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on him today. He's like, I'm going to kill Elisha. He's the one that brought all this on us. He brought those raiders of the Aramaeans here. Now the king is here with his whole army starving us out. I've had enough. I'm going to kill Elisha. And Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him, but the messenger came to him and said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still speaking with them, see, the messenger came down to him and he said, Look, this evil is from Yahuwah. Why should I wait any longer? And so Elisha's in his house and he knows that the messenger from the king is coming. And he says, When the messenger from the king gets here, hold him at the door and I'll deal with him. And the messenger who's held at the door says, Look, this evil is from Yah. You're the man of Yah. I'm not waiting any longer. And that's where we're going to pause the story for today. We'll get into the remainder next week. Bless y'all. Shabbat Shalom.